welcome to the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast. Today, we're talking about building something that I didn't think was possible for me to do a decade ago, and certainly not possible to do without a crazy budget, and that is becoming a wine collector. We are talking all things starting a wine collection at home, and we're doing this because to me, a wine collection was something that had to be like this over-the-top thing, underground in a cellar, reserved for the 1%, and required a skill set that I for sure did not have in my 20s. But now as a 30-something, I know that one, none of that is actually true. And two, having a wine collection at home is one of, if not the best way to learn about wine. It really has been a game changer for me to build a collection for myself. So I'm going to explain why that is to you a little bit later, but here to help me today is my guest, our reigning TikTok and Instagram queen of all things home entertaining, the one and only (laughs) coastal grandmother herself, Lex Nicoletta. Hello. Hi. I'm so happy to be here with my internet bestie. I was telling you, obviously, before we started recording, but I'm like, I refer to you when I'm talking to Nick. I'm like, Oh, my friend Amanda just went to Paso. These are the places that she <laughs> went. We have to go because I just feel like we've been following each other for a while now, and I love to follow you. So I'm so happy to be here and to talk to you. Oh, my gosh. You. Same. I remember like screenshotting when I saw that you were following me and sending it to my sister, and I was like, the coastal grandmother is following me, and I feel like my life's work is Stop complete, it. like like squad goals for Oh, sure. my God. <laughs> and I, I do want to clarify for people that you are not actually a grandmother. In fact, you are a, a new mom at that. Absolutely. I know people, I still get comments where people will find my page and they'll be like, you look amazing <laughs> for a grandmother. Like, what are your skincare secrets? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not a grandma. It's more of like a lifestyle. I can get into it mm-hmm. if we want to or not because it's. Yeah. Give, give the people a background on who the coastal grandmother is, what it embodies. This started because I am obsessed with hosting, homemaking, just all things like come into my house. I want to give you a good meal, a good glass of wine. You know, when you go to people's houses and you're like, you walk in and it smells amazing and the candles are lit and they have appetizers ready for you and you just feel so cozy and taken care of. That is what I'm always trying to achieve. And what, who embodies that is a coastal grandmother. So When I'm talking about it, I'm like, think about Diane Keaton in Something's Gotta Give. She's got this like maternal energy that you're just like drawn to. And so I started talking about this on TikTok. I think it was January of 2022. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden by March, it was popping off. It was a thing. And people were doing their, taking their own interpretations and spins on it. So a lot of it came across as like fashion, people were talking about it in the fashion sense or like going on trips. Oh, this is a coastal grandmother destination. Mm -hmm. So like Carmel or even, you know, Napa could be considered because they think of like Nancy Myers, the parent trap kind of a vibe. So that's where it came to be. And that's kind of like where I started, I guess, on social media. You are the coastal grandmother, but we are transitioning into a new trend that is the mob wife aesthetic. And I also know that your husband, Nick, is a big Sopranos fan. How are we navigating this trend? What are we doing? You are the only person I know that can do this properly. He sent this to me so excited (laughs) because he is, you guys, when I say this man, he's Italian. So he, and he's always like been proud to be Italian, but I would say within the last couple of years, we're leaning in. Okay. We're, he fully thinks he's Tony. Okay. He, we have the Sopranos merch. He, I just got him a pinky ring because he's like, I need a pinky yes. ring. All the guys have pinky rings. He tells me he won't wear shorts because he says mob bosses don't wear okay. shorts. That's like in the code. Okay. My husband is game. He's like, be the Carmella yes. to my Tony. I let like <laughs> fix the man a martini, wear a fur, do the thing. Like, I love it. Oh. I love it. I'm into it. Absolutely. I guess that's more like Mad Men than like <laughs> Sopranos, but I'm here for all. I feel like the two were sort of, I it think works. it works. And maybe that is how you navigate it, right? Like it's a little 50s housewife. It's a little mob wife. It's, it's a, a marriage. marriage. Yeah. Yeah. We need to talk about what is happening in the wine world. Are you ready? 
I'm so ready. So I assume you've been to Paris at some point in your... I have oh, not. Okay, well, we'll we need, Nick needs to rectify I that. Know. You stop in Paris on the way to Italy. I got pregnant uh, during the year that we were planning on doing our European oh, trip. Oh, yeah, that's not a so place to be I pregnant. I have not no. been yet. There's too much cheese in no. wine. It's, it's not good. It's not good. Exactly. Um, all right, well, on your next trip, there is a very famous restaurant called La Tour d'Argent. This restaurant was the inspiration for Ratatouille, and there's been this sort of like ongoing – Thing happening where not ongoing thing, but there's been this thing that's been happening over the past few years where there have been major wine cellars at restaurants that people have been looting and raiding and thieving from. And unfortunately, La Tour d'Argent was the the latest, but this is a little bit of an interesting one because they actually didn't know that it happened for quite a long time. So they stole $1.6 million worth of wine. You want to take a gander as to how many bottles that was? Because this is sort of the wild part for me. 1.63 million. I have full body chills. Yeah. How many How many bottles oh my do you God. think that would encompass? I feel like it's going to think – it's going to be less than what I think, right? I'm not going to lead the number. witness. You tell me. Okay. Is it 20 bottles? It is more than 20, but fair guess. It is 80 bottles of wine. 1.63 oh. million. That's like if anybody's what that's like what this, this thing time? holds here a mil, over you know a million and a half dollars wine. No, so what happened was they were they were doing this huge renovation uh, that happened from April 2022 to September 2023. And what's wild, and I I'm sorry to stereotype, this feels very French to me. They were like it happened sometime between 2020 and 2024, a four year window, oh. a four year window. They were like we think we think it, a million and a half dollars worth of wine went sometime in the last four years. Not sure when, but sometime. And we have no we answers. Have no answers. By the way, they have 300,000 ah. bottles total in the cellar worth $27 million. In What's their security system like? Like, do we have any cameras? I don't know. This is, And this is what, this, I have all the same questions you do, right? Like, were there cameras? Right. Like, who was <laughs> around? Like, why was an inventory not done? Like, what is, like, is it an inside job? Well, they said there's no force entry. So like more than likely, right? Maybe we're not going to start pointing fingers because we'll because, get sued, but you know. Right. <laughs> Alleg allegedly, allegedly. Allegedly. But but if you – you have to have some sort of knowledge about wine yes. to know what you're even stealing, yeah, for right? for sure. I mean, and some of these bottles that were stolen, they're like these like signed DRCs that are actually numbered. So out on the open market, like you could never sell these through a legit auction house. Like these would have to be sold privately, like on whatever black market exists for the wine world. What that is, I'm not sure. I've never Craig bought from, right? I've never bought wine from the black market, but I, I'm sure it exists. Um, so yeah, this is like wow. this is what a million and a half dollars worth of wine, 80 bottles. You gotta move them. This feels very I want the Italian job version of this. Like I want the movie in which somebody steals that much wine. That's what I was going to say. I'm like, this is giving art heist. Yes. It's like, we. I do need a movie. It sounds fabulous. Like set in Paris yes. and there are men with mustaches, like stashing yes. wine and baguettes in their bags. Yes. I like the baguettes. Incredible. Why not some pause while we're at it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Like we need a break for the cheese while we're, you know, this is a, oh, like, the accent you know, everything. like smoking a cigarette, like on the sidewalk, like while they're stealing wine. Like I want all the stereotypes in this, in this like Gus Van Sant film that we're making. That is some shocking yes. news. Agreed. By the way, if you happen to go there, this is like one of the oldest restaurants in the world. It's 442 years old. The wine list Probably weighs as I don't know how much your child weighs, but I'm guessing it's about the same weight. It's 17.6 pounds is the wine list or eight kilos. Oh my yeah. gosh. So good luck navigating that. All the podcasts in the world on navigating wine list, not gonna help you there. You definitely gotta help. You definitely gotta talk to this now. Oh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So if you're if you're in Paris, you know, when you're in Paris. I have check to it out. Start. Now it's like now I got it. Now I gotta, now I gotta, gotta go. go. All right. Are you a fan of Love is Blind? I watched the first season. Okay. I have not seen recently, but my sisters are huge fans. I am the biggest Love is Blind fan. I have – I watch it the day that it comes out. I wait with bated breath for the episodes to drop. Yeah. 
I will also say that my boyfriend is actually maybe a bigger fan than I am. We get very into it and love it. have lots of theories around the show. We're very, very big Love is Blind fans. But the one thing that's always bothered me is how much wine they drink in the damn pods. And we are six epi- six seasons into this show and they still have not figured out the wine situation. Like they're never showing bottles. It's always in these golden goblets. And I always have questions I'm like, what are these people drinking? It's a huge component, vital component at that to the show. Now- Cupcake has finally semi-rectified this. There is now an official Love is Blind wine called, wait for it, <gasps> Love is Wine. Incredible. Incredible. Get yeah. it? <laughs> for sixteen ninety nine, you too can drink oh my God. like the Love is Blind cast members. What do we think? Are we- Like you're in exactly, the pond. Exactly. Exactly. Are we into this? How do we feel about this? Also, why is there not a red wine? Why is it only a Chardonnay? I have thoughts. Is that what they're drinking? Thank you for bringing up the gold wine goblets because at first I'm like, what are we doing here? And then I realized that it was for continuity purposes. And so if they have to stitch something back, you couldn't tell how much wine had been, you know, drank from the glass and all of that. But I mean, it kind of branding wise, it makes complete and total sense because the glasses are such a part of the show. I am interested in what the wine is going to taste like. Same. Um, and I I will taste it. I like I'm I'm down to give it a shot. I don't have the highest hopes. Correct. Because it's cupcake, but no shade, no shade to cupcake or anybody who loves it, but never. And by the way, I that's what I used to drink when I was fresh, a fresh baby, it. 21. Cupcake, like, oh, you're I'm like, fancy. oh you have cupcake on the menu. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, no hate, no shade to Cupcake, but that is interesting. What are what are your thoughts about this? Well, one, I have been very vocal on Instagram about my love for Love is Blind. Like, you can't follow me on Instagram. And I'm not saying that the people of Cupcake should follow my Instagram, but I feel like... But they should. I feel, I feel like I'm a little miffed that, like, I was not consulted for this. Like, I... One, I wanted to be in on the process because I'm such a huge fan. Two, I feel like I should have gotten a heads up about this wine. And three, why is there not a red? Why is it only white? And why is it Chardonnay? Like such a polarizing wine. Like not everyone loves Chardonnay. Such a polarizing wine. Well, you know, maybe this is you putting it out there into the ether that maybe they need to tap you to do a red. I'm here. Because this seems like a perfect collab. I'm here for it. Thank you for your support in this endeavor. I appreciate I it. I support. Let's get the change.org <laughs> petition going now. Okay. Amazing. I'll, We're enraged. Oh, it'll be it'll be linked <laughs> below. Fantastic. And speaking of linked yeah. below, uh, if you want to drink yes. with us in the podcast, your opportunity to do so is also linked below in the description. Uh, as always, we are drinking on the show because that's how we roll via the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast Wine Club. We're going to be drinking the Dust to Glory Rutherford Cabernet today. And I do just want to mention we had a slight change. We had a little hiccup in the um, your little insert. So if you are already a member and you're like, wait, I thought this was the fo- following episode. It, that's us, not you. That was us. So we're just doing a little swap um, so that is what we're drinking today on episode 35. This is a delicious Cabernet. We're going to talk about it when we come back. But if you are not joining us in drinking, you want to be joining us in drinking forever and always, go ahead and do that. It's four bottles every two months, every eight weeks. It's 120 bucks plus tax, but including shipping. And then you get 10% off all of your wine access purchases, which is you know pretty great. And a great incentive to just keep drinking and fill your cellar with all the great wines we're going to talk to you about in just a second. All right, Lex, you got some you got some wine. I do. I love it. In your Gabriel glass. Yes. <laughs> the GG. You guys, she put me on to this glass and she didn't she not only put me on, she had them send me two glasses, which is like the kindest, sweetest thing. She like put me in touch via email with them. And now I don't want to drink wine out of any other glass. The way she talks about it, I'm like, well, I first of all, I believe anything Amanda says because she is my wine queen like if she's like do that I'm like okay done but this glass you guys I am in love and it's stunning do we have a video component of your podcast we do there will be a video component so I'll I'll put the video of so I stitched you one of your videos 
uh, talking yes. about the thick rimmed wine glasses, which should are just uh, should be abolished from here to four. Forever. forever. And they really do make a difference. I mean, your point was spot on, right? Like they really do make your wine taste different and not in a good way. And so I stitched that video and I was yeah. like, 100%, yes, here's what glass you should buy. And actually the the best part about that video, it was, it was, it was a much longer video that I'd initially made. And I had a few other glasses mm -hmm. and I was like, you know what? That's confusing. We're just going to, I'm just going to use the Gabrielle glass for this because I think it's easier and I think it, it drives the point home better. And so I talked about this Gabrielle glass and within like 30 minutes, I saw the video start to like, just, you know, when it starts to take off and you're Pop like, off. and you're like, oh yeah, this is going to be bigger than I thought yeah. it was going to be. And so I called, um, I called the owner of, of Gabrielle glass and I was like, listen, I just made this video. You had no idea that I was doing it. But here's the deal. I think this is going to take off in a very big way. And uh, if you can maybe like send like some glasses and then also like give people a code, like I think there would be something in that. So it ended up being like this whole thing. For and sure. the video, like the video did super well. And now there's like all of these people with Gabrielle glasses in their home, including me. I don't have mine today because I am traveling, unfortunately. But um, usually when you watch me on these videos, you will see my Gabrielle glass, which is to me, it's the little black dress. Absolutely. Wine glasses. It's the... One, it's only a one, must. it's a must. It's the staple in your closet. It's a universal wine glass. It works for all your wines. It's amazing. And if you're going to be building a wine collection, you obviously need great glasses to go with it. By the way, this is not intended to be yet another plug for you're, Gabrielle you're Glass. You're their unofficial I know, sponsor. I know. Like, but add it to the list. We need Love is Blind to call you and we need Gabrielle Glass to, we, we need a collab. I'm not going to keep us from drinking any longer. First of all, cheers. Here's to you Cheers. and drinking in the after drinking red wine in the <laughs> afternoon like two mob wives. I love no, literally. We're here for it. I have to pick up Tommy and Tony from school after this. Oh my gosh, that's right. Put on your fur, Giuseppe. Don your best Ferrari, and I love it exactly. Um, so we we're drinking an NDA wine. I could not have imagined a more perfect wine for this episode. And I say that because this is, so this is an NDA wine. It's a seller defender, which I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. Um, that is not, you won't see that on the label. That's a term that I use sort of internally as some other people use as well. Uh, but the reason that we're drinking this is because this is a, a critical component to your wine collection. But to back up, an NDA wine, we have a whole episode on this if you want to learn more about them. An NDA wine is basically just a white labeled wine. It's something that is either made by another winery or person who bought it, bought the grapes or bought the juice, they put another label on it and then it's sold. And so this one in particular is from like a very premium site in Rutherford, which also happens to be, do you know this already? You know what I'm going to say? What? Okay. So Rutherford no. is where the Nancy Myers Parent Trap Vineyard Parker oh, Knoll, yes. which by the way, I'm holding yes. it for us. This, this was option two for what I was going to wear today. I'm holding up the, the Parker Knoll sweatshirt. So if Parker Knoll were to exist, it would have existed in Rutherford, which is where um, where that movie was shot for the, all the, the house scenes. They actually used the Staglin house for that, which is in Rutherford. So we are drinking a wine from Rutherford. It is Cabernet. It is from Napa Valley. Hello. And I, I can't think of a better wine for us to consume on this joyous day. The most fitting. The most fitting. Do we love? We love. It is so good. It's good. It's... um. It's forty dollars, so it fits right into this category. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about it in a second, but we love that. Um, before I start talking about building a wine collection, uh, there is like a bit of a why to all of this, right? Like you should build a wine collection if you want to build one. But I also think that like for me, building a wine collection it ended up being this like pathway to learning about wine in a way that I never expected. And I'll just I'll tell a very brief story. When I was living in New York. My roommate gifted me this wine fridge. It was a little 12 bottle wine fridge. I think she got it like home goods. And it was so sweet. And I, I was like, oh my God. And I'd never had a wine fridge. I had just started in the wine industry. I was really excited. And I started buying wines for myself at, you know, an age where I could afford, you know, maybe like 20 to $40 bottles of wine. And that wine fridge sort of encouraged that entire process. And what it did was it forced me to buy wine for myself instead of the restaurant that I was buying for, right? Because I was just buying to serve other people's palates. It allowed me to figure out what my palate was. And then it also gave me like all of these choices to choose from when I was making dinner, when I was like hanging on the couch. And it sort of helped me to figure out 
how wine could fit into my life in a way that I didn't necessarily know how to do before. And why that was important was because it, it gave me these like very specific memories to access for when I was at restaurants and wine shops down the line. And I was trying to figure out, like, if I would sit down, I'd be like, oh, I want a glass. I'm having this for dinner. I want a glass of blah, 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 blah. I would have that, like, act, that memory to access instead of trying to pull from a book that I had read from or trying to figure out. I was like, oh, I think I served that to a table before. Instead, I had, like, my own things to go off of. And so building this wine collection ended up being, like, a really great way for me to learn how to enjoy and appreciate wine, which is really how you dive deeper down that wine rabbit hole. So that's sort of, like, my yeah. why for it. But I'm curious like Very cool. where you are on your journey because I know you travel to Napa and Paso and I know you're very yeah. into wine. I've been drinking Chardonnay since a wee age, but where are you now? <laughs> so like I said, I started out with Chardonnay when I was like, you know, 21 mm -hmm. and everyone would tell me like, you're not a real wine drinker if you're drinking Chardonnay. False. And that my, my palate is good. I agree. Um, but, and that my palate is going to expand and I'm going to love reds. And I was like, I was, I wouldn't have believed you. I was like, I used to think reds were disgusting. Mm -hmm. I could not stomach them. I was not on board. And then of course the day came and I got really, I feel like, you know, your taste buds change and everything. Yeah. And I became really into like steaks, which I had never been okay. before. And um, so then I started obviously drinking reds and I started off, you would think, you know, steak, drink a cab, but everyone was telling me that Pinot is kind of your gateway into drinking reds. Okay. That's what yeah, I was told. And I don't know if that's really true. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of how it happened for me. I, I started, like, I really fell in love with Pinot and I still love Pinot to this day. It's like one of my favorite wines. And that's why I was telling you, I'm very curious about wines from all over but specifically like I'm I'm interested in burgundies because I love pinots um but then I started drinking cabs and now I really I and I genuinely mean it like we were wine tasting um we were in Avila Beach on the central coast of California and so we went into Edna Valley and I went to Edna Valley Winery and they were like what they had a couple different options for the tasting and they were like well what do you really lean more towards. And I'm like, I actually love and appreciate everything. Like, I think there is a time and a place for everything. So now that's have a, a hot summer night and you're eating fish. So you'll want your white or right. maybe you're just craving that or what, whatever, whatever the reason is like my, I have everything across the board in my own collection currently. Well, I love that you're drinking broadly already because I guess my question to you, follow question, is like when you're going yeah. to these wine regions, like are you buying wine while you're there? And like if so, mm -hmm. how, like is there a method to your madness or are you just buying kind of like willy-nilly? It's a little bit willy-nilly to be honest. Um, we we love Napa. Um, both Nick and I both really like wine and we kind of went on this – a little bit of this journey together because – he was not super into it. And then we came to Napa and I feel like he fell in love with wine. It's hard not to fall in love with wine there. Oh my gosh. Well, and especially we love learning. I mean, it's, you go to a winery that has like the craziest history and you learn about it and you're like, you feel like you were talking about how now all of a sudden you had a personal connection to wine because you had your wine fridge yeah. and it's, you kind of start to feel like that with the wineries you've been to. And now, you know, the history and like, we were, we went in um, November to Napa and it was our first trip without our baby. And we were just, you know, going all over the place. And we went to Stag's Leap and just learned about their history. And so you're like, now, if I see a bottle of Stag's Leap out and about, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, like it brings you back to that. And you're like, you, and even, you know, we talk about, I love hosting. So you can have like a cool story to tell too. It's kind of like conversational. Oh, this is a good wine, but also this happened at this wine. And it just kind of like sparks conversation, which I think is really fun. No, it's true. I mean, this is one of the, the biggest things about wine travel is like it really does help you to make connections to places and like solidify feelings. And I think like if there's anything to be taken away from this podcast, it's that like you should be buying with intention, whether that's, you know, buying because there is a property that means something for you, to you or buying for a specific purpose. And so when we talk about how to break down your wine collection and what it should look like, 
there should be purposeful purchases throughout your entire closet, whether it's $10 or $100. They all should have a place in that lineup. And it should look a little like, you know, your closet at home. Like how many times have we seen TikTok and Instagram videos that are like, here's your capsule wardrobe. And like, you know, it kind of goes through like all the pieces you need to have. And like, you can't just have all blazers and turtlenecks. I mean, maybe, maybe you can, I'm not sure, but (laughs) <laughs> Me, I can't just have plays and like I want, you know, a few cashmere sweaters. I want a couple cocktail you need dresses. A t-shirt. Like, you need a t-shirt. Like I can't go get coffee in a cocktail dress. And so that's kind of what this whole premise of like how to build your wine collection is. And so I actually developed the system a couple of years ago and I have like a whole <clears throat> wine course on it, but I don't, I feel like I don't talk about it that much. I probably should talk about it more. And so I was like, oh, this is kind of the perfect episode to sort of break down like the the method that I've figured out works best for me. And so this sort of comes out of like when I was young and was, you know, trying to figure out like how to drink wine. It's not necessarily like you have to have this many wines from this region and that many wines from that region. Like it really just is about lifestyle and fitting the wines into specific places in your life. And so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go through the four like general categories of wine. Okay. So this is like, I this have is three. My... I have three that I do. So I'm curious. Okay. What yours are. Yeah. I'm curious if like they're, they're similar. Cause I think this is something that a lot of people think about, but I just, I put mine on paper. Cause I was like, this is helpful for me to see. So this is like my everyday wine collector. Like you don't need to spend a fortune to have a collection kind of deal. So I have four categories. The first is easy sippers. These are like your easy to find wines, easy to replace, meant to be drink, drunk young. Like you don't age them. Um, but you also don't want to overstock your cellar with these because they can be replaced so quickly. And so you don't want to take up like precious space with those. And then you also don't want to be in a situation, you're just down the line, you're like, oh man, I never, I never drank that vino verde and I bought way too much of it. So I only, you know, keep a few of those in there. The second category is weeknight wine dinners. So the, this is when you're like setting the table and you're like, roasting a chicken or, you know, making your HelloFresh, like whatever you're doing, you're going to sit down and you're going to have wine on like a Tuesday or Wednesday. Like this is the bottle that you're pulling out for that. And that usually sits between that like $25 and $40 category. These numbers can kind of like ebb and flow, you know, for whatever. Based on you. you, Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But like, that's the general thing. And these are also super low maintenance. Like you don't need a decanter. You might also bring these to dinner parties where like you're gifting it to the host and you're like, here, I brought this for us to drink. And then also I brought one for you because that's how we roll. Always bring two. Mm -hmm. Um, But they don't need a decanter. And they're good with food. Like that's the other biggest distinguishing factor is like your easy sippers don't need food. Your weeknight wine dinners probably want some food. And then you have your special case and savers. These are the ones. It was funny. You were talking about like stag's leap wines. I I might categorize those as like your special case and savers, even if they weren't you know, the most expensive bottles only because I deem the special occasion savers as something that requires more time to like sit down and talk about it. And so like, you know, people ask me, what are, what should I drink for Thanksgiving? It's not your special occasion savers. Like no one, no one cares about your bottles then. If you're having 25 people over for dinner, like not the time and place, like dial it down a little bit. So these are the, these are the wines that you're spending money on. These are the wines that you are maybe aging for a longer time. Maybe you're gifting it, but you're definitely not bringing it to someone's house because you would never bring a wine to someone's house and be like, can you decant this for me? Like, don't do that. Right. Um, <laughs> and like this, this is also the category that like you can take your time and fill as budget allows. So like for me, if I'm thinking about my closet, like, you know, it's the handbags that I've been like thinking about buying, but I'm not maybe like. I'm going to save up for that purchase and I'm going to break them out when it's necessary. And then the last mm-hmm. category, which is the one I sort of alluded to before, is the seller defenders. And that's where the NDA wine comes in. So these are the wines that like, they can kind of fit into the weeknight wine dinner category as well. But you know, when you have those nights where you're like, you've had too many bottles and they've all been really good and you're like, I need one more bottle, but I don't want to open like the super expensive one. That's where your seller yeah. defenders go. And that's a category of wine that you absolutely should have because you will run through your special occasion savers way faster than you want to. So oh, yeah. those, are, those are my four categories. What are your four categories? Or three categories? They're essentially like the exact same, right? And like you call them sippers. My husband and I call them drinkers, which it's the same thing. Love like it. it's, it'll, I'll be like, oh, this is a good drinker bottle. And for, for us, it's usually like, yeah, probably in the like, right around $30. And right now our go-to is a Vina Robles wine, which is kind of Mm. random. Okay. And 
they're the, they're that venue in Paso. And we accidentally like had to stop there. We were on a road trip and it was the halfway point for us. And Reese needed to get up and move around. So we popped in there and we literally put out her mat on the floor of this winery and we were trying these wines and I'm like, this is great. Let's buy some of this. And then we come to find out that it's like $30 a bottle. And that is like what I have on hand to drink. You don't feel bad running through them. Mm -hmm. That's, that's category one. Category two is like literally exactly like you said, if I'm, you know, making a steak dinner and it's a little bit more special, it's not like we just ordered DoorDash that night and just want something to drink. It's like, it feels more intentional. Yes. And then the third category is like the nice, nice bottle. It maybe has like a special memory tied to it. This is like, we're opening on Valentine's day or if, you know, something amazing happened at work or like just something that you like sit out on your patio by the fire pit and you can like really indulge in together. That Those are mine, but I like your other category because by the way, we all have people over after a dinner and everybody's been drinking all night and it's like all mm-hmm. we have are our nice bottles and it's physically painful because you're like, right? oh my gosh, you're like, we just ran through such good wine and nobody even cares. Nobody cares. This could be like a two buck chuck and they would not know because it's that exactly. at that point in the night and you're like, oh my gosh, I love that wine, but it's gone. Exactly. Well, and this is exactly what I'm saying. Like this is, this is what like buying with intention and making sure that your seller is stocked in the right way. So like Yes. I so I actually built like a blueprint for what your seller should look like. So if it's 48 bottles, your top row should be all of your bubbles. And so there's, you know, within those four categories, you have your champagnes, your whites, your pink, your red, and then your dessert. And so in the top rack, if it's 48 bottles or six across, your top rack should be all all sparkling, two of which should be easy sippers. So that's gonna be like your cavas, your proseccos, like anything under 20, those are good for like brunch and toasting, whatever. The next two should be like your bubbles that you can drink during the week. So your non-vintage champagnes, something that's like in that 30 to $50 category that's not super expensive, but not super cheap. And then the last two slots should be like the ones you're going to save. Those are like your tete cuvées, your single vineyard, your vintage champagnes, like something that like you're going to save for Valentine's Day for like you and Nick. And that's your top row. The next two rows should be your whites. You should have three easy sippers, five weeknight dinners, and then four of your like special occasion wines. Next row is like all your outliers. I always love to have like an outlier category of just like random in your closet. You always, you always have that, like those couple of things you're like, it doesn't really fit into any category. Like, I don't know. That's where that Mm -hmm. lives. Like have a row for yourself where it's just like, I really want this. It's really cool. It doesn't fit into a category, but I want to buy it, but only limit yourself. If it's 48 bottles, limit yourself to six of those. Don't buy crazy amounts of that wine. Don't buy, you know, one bottle. Buy, I always like to buy two because I, you know, you just never know. Get it again. Yeah. And then you have three rows of red. And this is, this also, like, if you're not a red drinker, like, move this around. Like, let this be yours. But this is really, I think if you're getting into Italian wine, like, this is where you could have some fun. You can have some fun in the whites as well. But, like, your easy sippers for your red, three bottles. I want to know about how you're entertaining at home with wine. Do you, are you, like, pretty, in, like, do you break out like specific wines for specific people? Do you break out specific wines for like brunches? Like I've seen some of your videos on like how you entertain, but like walk me through that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely specific wine for specific people. It's obviously if you know you're entertaining a crowd that appreciates and enjoys wine, it's so fun. And you can like, it's a whole conversation. If I'm entertaining people who you know, they're it's like white or red, like that's, they don't, you know, they're not super into it then I'm obviously I want to give them a good bottle. I'm never going to serve a bottle that I wouldn't drink myself, but maybe what we won't venture off into these like crazy bottles of wine. I think it's fun to pair wine with food. Like I was saying, so I recently this year, actually, and my whole life, really, um, my dad is super into football. He like was a football player. And so we've watched football growing up, but um it's very fun to host football and I'm like but how can we make this just a little bit bougie and I'm like champagne champagne and caviar that's how we're gonna do it so or fried chicken by the way I was just talking with my best friend about this and we Nick and I have recently really fallen in love with champagne whereas before I was like 
it just wasn't my thing. I would, you know, I would sip it on a special occasion, but now it's like, for some reason on the same day, we're both like, we love champagne. So yes. he's a big fried chicken guy. And I think that that's what we're doing for the Super Bowl is yes. champagne and fried chicken. <laughs> I actually, I did it. Was it last year or the year before I did it? I did a video and I think I had like a, like a Shamsberg or like a Jay Sham or something with fried chicken yeah. that I got from someplace in Napa. I think it was, I think it was last year. Um, okay. It's so good. So I'm like, I mean, grab the caviar by all means, but like, yeah. I there's... love some fried chicken too though. So that's, I, I need to taste that pairing. But this is also like, you know, what I'm talking about when you don't have to like champagne, great. Like if you have a weeknight where you're like, I'm just going to pick up it can literally be KFC or Chick-fil-A or whatever. Like yeah. I'm going to pick up Chick-fil-A for dinner. Like these are the moments where you're like, all right, if I'm going to have a wine with this, what would I have? And so when you have this like arsenal of things to choose from and champagne is already in there, like this is where you can have some fun with experimenting and like really getting to know these food and wine pairings and making them part of your life. A hundred percent. I agree with you. And that's that like – that's why we we just recently built a wine fridge in our house and it's only a 50 bottle wine fridge it's it's little but it it's perfect, it's perfect. Like, yeah it's it it works for us too because we were storing wine like not properly and because we were what running is, out what of is space. not properly for you i don't i'm scared to tell you i don't want to say no tell me it's your i mean i'm not going to tell you it was not on its side it was standing okay. up in the pantry okay, okay. It I'm, was a, I'm okay with sus. I'm okay with pantry life. I'm and I'll tell you why because I think at least okay. if it's in the pantry, it's staying That's away cool. from light. Um, you know the whole like laying on the side thing, like for sure, like you know wine prefers to be on its side, but really like that's more for long term aging than like short term. So you know if you've got something that's going to go the distance, like get yourself a proper wine fridge, make sure that like the wine's laying down. But I mean if these are like grab and go things, like a pantry is fine to me. Like. Behind closed doors where light's not going to be hitting it, ideally a consistent temperature. Sometimes pantries are in a kitchen that gets like, you know, moved, like fluctuates with temperature a lot. And so like that's not always ideal. But I think this is also what trips people up is like they think that they have to have these, you know, these huge basements. A cellar. Right. And like that's just not the reality. The reality is like for most of us it is – I mean, this is not my house by the way. The reality is most of us don't have these like beautiful – wine fridges that, you know, I'm standing in front of right now. Like most of us have something that's like freestanding or we have a closet. Like I recently turned my little, I had one of those old nooks under the stairs. And oh, it, yeah. like, and I, I took, and it had some shelves already in there. And so I bought one of these, um, bamboo wine racks from Amazon and I shoved it in there and the room stays like, stays dark. It stays pretty cool. I put some like under, um, these like motion sensors stick on lights so that I could see in there. And I turned that into like, that is legitimately like my wine cellar right now. Amazing. I want to play a little game with you called what are we serving Nancy Myers edition? Obsessed. And the game is this. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go through, um, fictitious situations from various <laughs> Nancy Myers movies. Okay. And I'm going to ask you, and I'll do it too. I'm going to ask you what wine and or like snack if you would like okay for these fictitious situations so starting with a perennial favorite of mine the parent trap you are gossiping poolside with meredith blake the unsung hero of the parent trap just kidding i feel like poolside i feel like you have to do like a really great sauv blanc or a rosé i mean nick and i dirt like in the summertime, we want a rosé. I have recently had, like, I've discovered orange wine. And yes. that is something that it's like, I was like, wait, what? I was like, is it made from oranges? <laughs> like, what is what is this? So good. So I would probably do, I would do a rosé with Mare. And I feel like she is a salad girly. So yeah. I, I would make, like, a really crunchy, delicious salad and serve with it. But what are, what are you doing? Love rosé for this situation. Rosé is the obvious choice for poolside wine. If you're going to do that, my favorite snack, and you've probably done this, is radish, raw radishes, butter and salt. Let me dip in butter and salt. Have you ever done this? In bread? No, no bread. Are you talking about with bread? Oh, no, just no. radish, really? softened butter, 
and then a little Maldon salt. So you take the radish. You literally use butter as a dip, which is one of my life mantras. Amazing. You dip yeah. the radish in the butter. You add a little Maldon sea salt, and with a glass of rosé, chef's kiss. Perfect. Amazing. That is like that perfect. sounds so good. I love a radish with butter and bread and salt, but I've never had it alone like how you said. And now I need to. That well, sounds we amazing. Know, we all know Meredith Blake was not eating the carbs. Like nobody. No, that's what I was gonna say. I'm <laughs> like, I know, I know she has like a strict diet she's adhering yeah. to probably <laughs> we'll stay with the parent trap and do a pizza okay. party with grown-up annie and hallie oh my gosh maybe like a zin love zin zin and pizza is delicious yes i would say maybe a zin i really love um opolo that's like the zin Ooh, that's like my go-to that? zin it's out of paso i believe okay. and where i'm from a lot of people drink it um, but specifically their mountains in that's, okay. I feel like that's what I'm drinking when I'm having pizza. Okay. Love it. Zin and pizza are delicious. What about you? I am a Lambrusco lover. I know that you recently did the Lambrusco spritz. So Lambrusco yes. spritz would also be delicious. Uh, Lambrusco and pizza is delicious. I feel like if we're doing pizza party, that kind of like is somewhere in the middle of easy sippers and weeknight dinners. And so Lambrusco kind of fits the bill for me there. But also I would maybe venture on doing something Italian, like a dolcetto from Piemonte. So the, you know, Piemonte is known for the Nebbiolo grape, but they also have this really delicious grape called dolcetto. And it's like, it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. I would definitely, if, if you're trying to get into Italian wines, like lean into dolcetto's, Lean into some Sicilian stuff. Like, you know, we I think we just talked about the frappato the other day um, on the podcast. And, um, oh, we also talked – you mentioned orange wine. Orange wine and pizza yes. is also delicious. Uh, and we had, Our last episode, we talked a lot about orange wine. But you can go a lot of different ways. It really depends on your toppings. depends on, like, are you doing red sauce, white sauce, whatever. But, like, the theme here is just, like, <clears throat> nothing too expensive with pizza. There's some, yeah. some like, lowbrow things that really work with highbrow wines, for example. I had a cheesesteak the other day with a 1980 Penfolds Grange and the internet Incredible. had feelings about that. And I thought it was brilliant because it was like all – Were they mad? Words. Some people were angry. They, I had some, some name calling. They were like, you Yankee drinking like oh. uh, You know. You know how it is. Classic. The, dumps, the dumpster fire that is the comment section. They had feelings. Oh, especially um, when a video goes viral. I can't even look. Oh, yeah. Once it gets past a certain – we were just – I was talking about this with our, our friend Super Vino Brothers in the last episode. And, yeah, once it gets past a certain point, you're like, nope. This has reached outside of my circle and into a planet that – The wrong that side of TikTok. Did, wrong side of TikTok. Nobody wants to be on this side of TikTok. I don't know how it landed in your feed, but it's there. And I'm no. so sorry for that. Um, yeah, exactly. Moving to uh, the movie that makes me cry no matter what, Father of the Bride. We are oh. celebrating – I know. We are celebrating the we engagement it. of Annie and Brian McKenzie. What okay. are we breaking out for them? We have to do a champagne, right? And yes. I don't know a lot about champagne. So this – you can really, like, enlighten me on where where I need to start because – Okay. You know, obviously, vu like vuv is what everybody drinks, and yes. it's it really is so good. Like it's it's good for a reason. Um, Nick and I, when we moved into our house, we were gifted a bottle of Dom, and I was Ew. like, this like hot hot take, but I hate it. Okay. I don't think it's good. Okay. I thought I think vuv is better. Okay. And but right now, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, but Schramsberg is like our go to. Love shrimps. I would do a one of their J Shram for this. Okay. I would up the you know up the occasion since it's this is more like a special occasion saver kind is of. Is that moment. their bougier? Yeah, it's the one that they. I mean, okay. all, I think all the Shamsbergs are vintage labeled, but yeah, the J Shram they only put out in the best vintages, um, and they're in a slightly different package, a slightly different bottle. So yeah, I would do okay. I would do something vintage. So like, the thing with Dom is like it's very. It's a polarizing wine for a lot of people because it has this sort of like oxidative, very like apple-y feel. And it mm. is not, you know, Vuv is is made to be delicious, like on consumption. Like it is, you know, it is the right amount consistent. of dosage. It's consistent. Um, Dom is only made in the best vintages. It's the Tetsu Cube from Moet and Chandon. And it's a wine that, you know, is it's interesting to me that it's gotten the amount of 
like attention that it has over Hype. the last how yeah how many decades as like being the you know the greatest champagne for people to you know if you get a bottle of Dom like that means something yeah. because it is it's you're right it's not the most friendly of options I would opt for Krug which is sort of a sister brand mm. to Dom. It's still non-vintage, but that to me is like, that's a wine that you break out on a good occasion. Uh, I would also mean, you know, anything vintage, like anytime you see a vintage on a champagne label, like that means something. Like that means that, that because champagne is usually non-vintage. It's only in the best vintages that you'll see the actual vintage on the label. So vintage champagne or vintage Schomsberg would be for me. Um, if you were throwing a bridal shower for Annie Banks and and her mother for Father of the Bride Part 2, what are we serving at the bridal shower? That's tough because I feel like I feel like a, when you're at a shower, like the girlies want champagne or rosé. Like that's yes. what I feel like the showers that I'm going to. So, I mean, that, that actually would be a fun occasion to break out some orange wine too. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you were the one who actually introduced me. I think one of your TikTok videos a long time ago, and I'm not going to pronounce it right. Is it pronounced X? The rosé? Oh, like A-I-X. The A-I-X? A-I-X? I yeah. don't think that was me, but yeah, the X rosé is good. X de Provence. Okay. Yeah. I love that rosé. Yes. I feel like that's what I that's what I serve the most if I'm having people over and it's summer. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that that's, I mean, also Vouv. Like I feel like all, just the girlies want Vouv on a, on a, on a Saturday morning with their croissants and their bridal shower. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think bubbles are appropriate. If you are going more budget friendly, like I always tell people, under thirty dollars, don't buy champagne. Like even if even if you're sort of like, hey, I can get this champagne for twenty, don't do it. It's not worth it. It's going to be terrible. Um, opt for like the Cremants, and there's one that I really love right now. I'm actually going to put a video out on it today. Uh, called the Henri mm-hmm. Champelieu Cremant Rosé. That is delicious. That's like 24, 25 bucks. Really awesome. If you want to like up your budget a little bit, like that's where you go to non-vintage champagne. Like if you want to do Vouv, great. There's also a few like smaller producers that I love called like Jacques Laurent's great, Brunyon's great. Um, but keep it in that like 40-ish, 40 to $50 bracket. And then the the last one from It's Complicated, which I just recently watched again. It's still, uh. it still delivers. Uh, oh, Meryl, Meryl Streep, Alec Baldwin, uh, all the things. Everybody's in there. Uh, John Krasinski. Oh, my gosh. Um, Jane Adler, played by Meryl Streep, is making a delicious – I feel like this is going to resonate with you. California seafood bake at home for the kids. Oh. What? Oh, my gosh. Um, like a Pinot or a Sauv, um, a Sauv Blanc. I – like I'm such a themed clams girly, mm. and that's what I will – that's what I'll pair with that. And I think of, I think of like Nancy Myers serving like linguine and clams. Yes. With a nice like Sauve Blanc. For me when it's like. Um, Sancerre. Sancerre is great. Uh, Poi Fume. So if you love Sancerre or, and or Sauve yeah. Blanc, same great. Uh, Poi Fume, great. It looks like Poli, P-O-U-I-L-L-Y, F-U-M-E. They're like right next door to each other. Very similar vibes. But for me, like, it hits a little more textured and they also okay. can be a little less expensive. It really depends on the seafood and also whatever wine goes in your seafood bake mm. is the wine that you should be serving. So if you're, like, adding a splash of Chardonnay, adding a splash of Sauvignon Blanc, um, that is a dish that could go either way. You could go Chardonnay. You could go Sauvignon Blanc. It really depends, like, how much butter you're adding. If you're adding more butter, then I go more Chardonnay. But – Mm-hmm. You went bright. You went minerally. I also feel like if you know, in this situation, I want something that's a little. I want white burgundy, but I also mm. don't want something that's like too over the top. So in that case, I'm doing like a petit chablis or bourgogne blancs, like something that's not single vineyard. Some you know something that's not like premier or grand cru or something like that. I want something that's just like easy, not a lot of oak. Um, that's going to be clean and like bring out all the delicious minerality from the I'm sure very fresh fish that Jane Adler has of course scored from her local Santa Barbara fishery questions as we wrap up the show I know you had some I don't know how many we've covered but if you have any others I want to know how I get into burgundy and like where where I should start with burgundy because that's where we there's only one restaurant 
in the town that we live in that has a psalm mm-hmm. and she's not there all the time and so when we go we're like we were exploring this list and I actually I need to show you a screenshot because this is this is like the wine that I had where I was like I think I'm in love with burgundy and I need to and I actually ordered a bottle of it on online and I think it I think I got scammed because I ordered it three months ago and it's still not here but this yeah I'm definitely not going to try to pronounce it but it's t-h-i-b-a-u-l-t t-h-i-b-a-u-l-t and Geller. then yep okay that's a good bottle it's a it's a 2017 and it was it literally knocked my socks off I haven't stopped thinking about it since this is my issue is like okay for the people that are living in a smaller town that don't have access and like don't want to be like me getting literally scammed like at what website did I order this bottle from we don't know I think wine chateau is that a real website I'm not sure yeah if you haven't heard of it that scares me so I like how are you get like how am I going to get a bottle of something like this that's not at a total wine or a bevmo or is there a good bottle that I need to explore at these places that I, like I have access to or do I order online you you can order online um burgundy is the really good stuff is highly allocated it's a, it's a very small place and like there's very tiny parcels so like when someone makes something there's usually not a lot to go around and because you live on the west coast it often like stops in New York and doesn't make it all the way Mm. to California. Um, So Burgundy is one of those things that you definitely should buy from like a trusted place and a trusted authority because there is a lot of fraudulent wine out there. Like Mm. Wine Access does sell great Burgundy. That's who sponsors this podcast. So I Mm -hmm. recommend. Restaurants are a great way to get into Burgundy. And I'll tell you why. And you're going to spend – Obviously, a little bit more money at a restaurant, but if you get to know your psalm at a restaurant, they're going to tell you which bottles to drink and when. And with Burgundy, it's so vintage dependent and wines from Burgundy can change in a heartbeat and they can break your heart if you're not drinking them in the right era of their lives. So I I recommend going through restaurants because the restaurants are typically who get the best allocations of Burgundy. And then from there, what I would do is also when you find something that you like, look at who imports that wine because the importers of Burgundy are super, super important. So you have Kermit Lynch, Becky Wasserman. There's some smaller ones like um, True North Imports that comes into California. These are people that are on the ground looking for great bottles of Burgundy, great producers, and they're bringing them in. A lot of times because, you know, because Burgundy is this like this region that everybody wants to drink from. You have a lot of people bringing in like the lesser bottles of lesser mm. quality wines because they know that they're going to sell because people are like, I just want to drink Burgundy. But to me, like the best way to go about it is like go through those those particular trust agents as importers and start kind of keeping track of like, all right, I like this producer and from this region. Like it really, it's producer, it's region, it's vintage. There's, that's really the only three things you need to know. And if you liked all three of those things, start trying to figure out of those things, what did I like? If it's producer, great. If it's um, Gervais Chambertin or Volnay or Chambon Musigny, the place, great. Keep drinking from there and drink other producers. But like it does, it requires deep pockets. It requires a lot of patience and Mm -hmm. um, it requires definitely finding a good trust agent. Like the ones that are on Wine Access are great. Like they sell Bouchard, which is wonderful. Um, You know, one that's like really easy to find is uh, Louis Latour. Like they have a lot of Burgundy that comes out of their portfolio. They also direct import, which is really interesting. But I will, I will straight up tell you, like as a wine lover, Burgundy is the toughest. It will, it will break your heart every time. Um, but once you have that like one great bottle, you're like, oh, sucks you back in. Literally, it makes you, it's the chase of it. Yes. Like I I do this thing called Chipotle roulette where it's like I you never know what you're gonna get if it's like a good. If it's going to be a yes. good bowl, it's going to be fresh oh or if it's not. I, I know yeah. this life so well. Yeah. And it's like, and so I, I'll like post like, okay, we're playing Chipotle roulette. And is it a fresh one or does it taste yeah, like especially it's Especially if you door dash it. Oh, goodbye. And Forget I had it. like a psychology, I don't know, professional uh, message me. And she was like, this is actually something called intermittent reinforcement. And it's like the strongest type of reinforcement because 
it's the chase of it. So you don't know what you're, if, if the, the good one tastes that much better because you've had a bad one twice. So it, it kind of sounds like that's what you're describing with, yeah. with Burgundy. When you find that bottle that it's like, oh yeah, it's like, it feels like a serious win. That is exactly what Burgundy is. Intermittent reinforcement. <laughs> Hundred percent. Um, one thing that is consistent is the bottle that we've been drinking. I don't know if you've been going back to it, but like this oh, to yeah. me is like very textbook Rutherford Cabernet. It's like soft but intense and like has all of like that great kind of like dark fruit. It is everything. I feel like you need a s you need a steak for dinner tonight. I hope that's on your agenda. No, a hundred percent. I can't wait. I can't wait for Nick to get home and realize that I've had a half a bottle of wine and I've got but do like steak a, going. Do like a, <laughs> But do like a tri-tip with it or like, you know, like a flank steak oh, yeah. or something. Like I feel like that's what this Okay. Is. Yeah. We so, love a tri-tip around here. Yeah, exactly. Who doesn't love a tri-tip? Um, <laughs> I know that you want to get back to drinking and I don't know, maybe your <laughs> child as well. Uh, so where can people find you and all the things? Is there anything that you would like to plug? Tell me. Tell me everything. You can follow me on TikTok. I feel like that's where I'm the most active is TikTok. Um, it's Lex, L-E-X, Nicoletta, N-I-C-O-L-E-T-A. And then on Instagram, it's the same thing. I just have an underscore. So Lex underscore Nicoletta. You can follow me there. I don't have anything crazy to plug. Just follow along the journey. And hopefully I will find that bottle of Burgundy that we're talking about and I can report back. Next time you're in... Napa and I'm in Napa and we're drinking wine Please. and doing all the things. And um, I also need to be like hosted by you because I feel like I need. I would love to. This was so fun. Thank you so, so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, keep us all posted on your wine drinking collecting journey. I need to see more of this on TikTok. I absolutely will. Thank you for having me. It was so fun. It went by so fast. <laughs> yes. Okay. 